Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about the five love languages by Dr. Gary Chapman. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom Butler Bowden. And as you know by now, what we do is take a classic nonfiction book, um, whether it's uh, useful in your work and life or just makes you think, and we uh, dissect it and discuss it. And uh, as the Book Insights curator, I will give my uh, take on what I think the value of the book is. Yep, and I will also chime in and give you some latest news about the title and the author. Now, for the most in-depth knowledge about this book, we recommend two things. One, this podcast is brought to you by Memoed, so be sure to check out the savable, shareable 10-point memo on this book. Um, you'll find a link to it in the show notes. And two, we recommend that you listen to the Book Insights episode on this book. That's going to be your more detailed summary, overview, analysis. But here in the Book Lounge, it's more of just an informal chat on the book of the week. Um, so this week we are bringing on a guest who is a writer and a trauma-informed relationship coach based in New York City. She has lots of experience putting the five love, love languages to you great use in her work, her writing, and helping people with relationships, um, also with dating and mental health and all that good stuff. So please welcome Julie Wynn. Hi everyone, <laughs> excited to be here. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great to have you with us. Uh, so, Julie, um, this book's been around for quite a while now. Um, when did you first uh, come across it? And what was your initial reaction when you read it or listened to it? Yeah, so I came across this when I was matchmaking. I believe I was like 23, 24 when I first found out about this book. And my initial reaction was that I just loved how... Um, simplistic it was like I think it's a very easy concept for people to understand it distills very I think practically like five different ways that we can interpret it and like receive love I think that is huge for people in dating because it can be it's intense it's a lot to navigate if you're left to your own devices and I think that the book does a really good job of yeah just like really simply bringing these concepts forward and being like okay you may not um, receive love the way that your partner might. So it, it's good to just have this like sense of curiosity around this and then just kind of talk to each other about it. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And if you're not familiar with the Love Languages book, you must be under a rock somewhere because it has been <laughs> everywhere. It's definitely entered the like public zeitgeist. It's, uh, you know, people talk about oh, I, my love language, your love language. It's, it's definitely big. But if you're unfamiliar, um, basically, Dr. Gary Chapman, he determined from decades of experience as a pastor and a marital counselor that there are five primary ways that people demonstrate and receive love. He calls these love languages. Uh, so by understanding the way that you most prefer to receive love and the preferences of those around you, how they like to receive love and how you like to give love, um, you can improve communication, appreciation, and ultimately increase love. So that's kind of the gist of the book. Um, so how have you seen people put this into practice, Julie, with your work and your experience? Um, what have you seen in terms of people using this wisdom? I think the biggest thing is that it just nurtures this sense of curiosity towards themselves as a person and then the person that they're in relationship with. Because I think there's this implicit desire when we're dating someone that they're just going to read our mind. They're going to know exactly what we want. They're going to be able to give us those things naturally. And when they don't, we believe that it's like this fundamental mismatch, that there's something about the connection itself, whereas it's more of like a very simple communication problem. Mm -hmm. It's like maybe instead of, you know, they're not the right person. Maybe it's really just a conversation about this is what I need and this is what, why I need it um, based on like my childhood upbringing and like, you know, growing up acts of services was really big to me. So now I look for that. And when you don't do certain things for me, um, that's when I start to feel really disconnected to you. I think that's the most useful, useful way that people um, can use it. Mm -hmm. And um let's remind ourselves what the languages are um the there is words of affirmation so uh saying nice things to your partner or writing them notes etc there's physical touch some people this is extremely important for others it's not so much um third is quality time spending with uh, your partner uh the fourth is giving gifts 
Um, for some people, this is a big deal. For others <laughs> who forget birthdays, um, they get mm -hmm. put in the sin bin. For them, it's not so big. And the, and the fifth is acts of service. Um, so, Julie, I mean, amongst those um, in your work, uh, which, which ones have you felt sort of cropped up a bit more than others, perhaps? I would say that words of affirmation and acts of services are huge. I mean, all of them are equally really important to the person um, where that's their primary love language. I would say the misunderstood one is gift giving. <laughs> a lot of people kind of relate it to materialism or they relate it to the monetary value behind the gift. And I think people that are really into that love language, it's more so about the act, um, like the thoughtful act that goes behind purchasing that gift. It's like seeing it at the store, thinking about them, buying it for them, like that kind of deliberation, the person that receives the gift really appreciates that, but taken on its face, a lot of people believe it's like, oh, you want me to buy you like, like a, you know, like this huge, huge thing. And it's not so the case. So it's really important to like dig into. Um, all of these different styles of gift giving, right? But not only just like understand it from like the book conceptual view, but understand it from like an individual perspective of like how your partner themselves like interprets um, that particular style. Interesting. And so just to uh, get everyone up to speed, if we talked about sort of um, languages, which sort of implies what you're speaking, but just like language, you have to do both. You have to interpret and you have to be able to speak. And both of those in, in relationships are, are different. So just like Julie was talking about with gifts, um, there are some people who love to receive gifts. And there's some people who are like, oh gosh, now you, now I have to get you something. It's like mm -hmm. this whole, you know, they don't enjoy it. And then there's other people who, you know, it, they're, they're comfortable uh, receiving gifts, but they don't want to give anything. They can't figure it out. And so, you know, I think that's just something that we have to kind of keep in mind as we discuss this book is that it's almost like two different things. So there's mm -hmm. your own love language that you're comfortable giving, which may or may not be the same as what you're comfortable receiving. And then you've also got to think about your partner because they've got the same dynamic going on. They might be really comfortable giving you all the words. They can tell you, you know, you're great. They can give you all the compliments. They can affirm you verbally, but then, you know, they don't want that in return. They want something else. Don't, don't compliment me back. I want something. I want time. I want service. I want something else. So mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of make sure you know, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening, you're like, wait, what are these languages? So just know that it's giving, it's receiving. And sometimes there's a mix match. Sometimes there's not. So uh, right. have you seen yeah. much of that, the sort of mismatching of languages and how that dynamic works out? A hundred percent. And I think a lot of people mistake in the love languages is like, I have to be fluent in what my partner wants. I mm -hmm. think it's much more interesting to come at it from a perspective where it's like there's five different love languages how can I apply that to my partner at all different types of situations and not mm -hmm. necessarily just you know like let's say there's this access services like all you do is then hyper focus on like chores and like these domestic responsibilities but then you forget everything else <laughs> so right. like I don't need to worry about gift giving I don't need to worry about you know um telling them certain things because they care so much about access services that's not what it is I think it's more so just like I was saying before, like maintaining the sense of curiosity towards your partner at all points. And like, how can I make sure that I'm filling up their love tank appropriately um, and like doing it in an applicable way? Like you're not just throwing it at them every day and you're like, check, I've done it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you should feel loved. Mm -hmm. It should be much more so like this very like um, sustainable journey that you're going on with your partner and just kind of being really thoughtful about it as much as you can. Yeah, I think one of the, the criticisms I've read about the book from a therapist was that people fall into the trap of seeing it in a transactional way. Mm -hmm. Like the, the guy's written that, you know, four notes a month, so he's ticked that box. and He's uh, done. <laughs> wondering why it's not working mm -hmm. um, and, and, and working both ways. Um, so, yeah, there's something, is, is there a, is there a sense in which um, you sort of a bit faking it here, um, like to please your partner? You don't really feel you don't feel like touching or writing the notes or going on the bike ride, but you just mm -hmm. sort of do it because it's their language. Like um, if you don't feel it, I mean, is that good in a relationship? 
I think that's a really good question. I think that more so speaks to like being performative in a relationship, right? And that goes to like that curiosity towards your partner. Are you curious and wanting to deeply understand them? Or are you receiving what they tell you and just being like, I'm just taking that exactly like what you're saying. I'm not going to dig into it. I'm not going to try to understand why this is your love language. I'm just going to give you these things. Um, Like if it's physical touch, I'm just going to touch you. But then it just feels like sterile. Like you're just touching them because like, you know, they like to be touched, but you're not really connected to it. I think if there's not that sense of connection, this true sense of like, I really want to make sure that you're feeling loved, then absolutely um, the act will fall flat. And that is definitely a criticism of the love languages. Um, People think as soon as they understand it, theoretically, then everything should make sense. But that's really half the journey. The other half is like internalizing it, applying it thoughtfully um, and continuing to like maintain that in your toolkit in whatever way that looks like. So, and I know that the book um, and some of the extra resources that Dr. Gary Chapman has put out there, they offer like tests for people Mm -hmm. to take if you're not sure what your primary love language is. Um, But what do you say to that person who's like, yeah, I want to put these into practice, but I have no idea what my love language is. I like all of them. Give me a gift. Take me somewhere. You know, tell me I'm great. I like all of them. So what do you say to that person (laughs) that's like, I just want all of them and I just want to do all of them? Yeah, I mean, I respect a person that's like, I want it all. Of like, course. why not? <laughs> like, get it all for yourself. But mm-hmm. I think um, what is more interesting is like, so I wrote a deep dive for Mind, Body, Green above about the love languages. And in that, I wrote down like this numerical list of the five different love languages and like the things that you might want if that's your primary love style. And it is important to kind of, distill it down to one to two love languages that are super, super important to you because it is, you know, outside of a relationship, there's a lot of things that take up someone's life. You can't always be so keyed into your partner and all of these things that they need on a day-to-day level. So it's good to just kind of like think, okay, you know what quality touch, I mean, quality time, I don't need that as much. Acts of services, I can't do without that. What about acts of services do I really like about it? Well, I like it when they, um, you know, change the oil in my car without me thinking about it. Cause I always put that on my to-do list and it always goes on the wayside. It's like thinking about that detail is super important. And then communicating that to your partner that even though all of these different styles are important to you in some way, there's one to two styles that you've identified um, are truly meaningful and you would like your partner to pay attention to it. And I, I think that's a really beautiful thing about the love languages is that you get to name these abstract, like it's a very abstract feeling of like, this is how I feel seen and understood. But the love languages is a way for you to like, ask your partner for those things. Like you will make me feel very happy. um, You know, if you give me quality time or acts of services or whatever. Yeah, that's such a great point. It really does put some very concrete action items on some very abstract stuff. It kind of makes me go like, oh, of course, this is written by a guy because he wants to know exactly what to do. Like, <laughs> I, I thought that too when I was reading the book. Of course he would. He would right? want to have everything down. <laughs> exactly. If it was yeah. a woman, it would just be like, I don't feel loved, period. That's the book. Like, you know. Just one page. That's all you need. Yeah, you know? Exactly. Exactly. But Talk yeah, to me. Figure it out. That's right. That's right. No, he's done such a great great job of taking something as abstract as like, I don't feel appreciated or I don't feel loved, that kind of thing. Or the opposite too of like, I want to show you love and I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm doing everything I can. And he's saying, okay, if that's what's happening, if you're demonstrating love and it doesn't feel like it's being received, or if you're not feeling like you're receiving love, um, this might be why. And here's exactly what you can do. And here's, you know, some tools to kind of equip you for how to deal with, with that issue. Um, so Absolutely. have you- have you seen that in your work in terms of people like trying to show love or trying to receive love and, you know, seeing that mismatch and then the love language is being able to help? Right. So with my clients, a lot of them will, they'll have a complaint and it'll just be this very general complaint. I don't feel loved by my partner. And it's when you're saying that to your person, how do they, what do they even do with that information? It's like this wall of like, where do we start? How do we start to like impact this and interrogate this because I don't know what's making you unhappy. Like as soon as you're able to have this like starting point of like, 
it's because access to services is really important to me. And like, you keep canceling on our plans. And that's a really big thing of access to services is that if you say you're going to do something, the person wants you to remember and follow through. Follow through is very important. And if you're not doing that, the person may start to just then feel this feeling of disconnection and not necessarily know why. Um, and then, you know, they come at, at it with like this very big complaint. So that's an easy way to be like, oh, this is why it's because you keep canceling plans and I really need you to follow through or just confirm the things that you can actually do. So then I don't feel disappointed later on. And it can be very vulnerable to say those things because you're essentially saying, I'm asking if you can meet a need of mine. Um, very vulnerable to present that, but that deepens the connection when you're able to do that with your partner. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and um, Julie, one of the criticisms I've read of the book, uh, again, from another therapist, is that um, although it's extremely um, useful and it's obviously helped millions of people, it won't solve, you know, really deep underlying issues. Yeah. Um, you know, like uh, commitment or passion, intimacy. Uh, there are just some things that's just a bit too much of a mismatch or there's some big issue mm -hmm. that happened in a relationship that no amount of um, small acts is going to fix. So I wondered what's your take on that? Yeah, that's something I also wrote about in the article too, because there, although I, I do love the book itself because it's very popular, it's very mainstream. Um, so people know their languages at this point. It's not entirely, um, I wouldn't say it's the, if you know it, that's, you're now like sold, you're perfect, you know, like this is one thing you can have in your toolkit. And I think that if people just rely on that fully, then they're missing out on all of these other dimensions of how we can really relate to our partner. Um, like the love languages, I think what is useful about the concept is that it invites this sense of like curiosity, like I mentioned before. and this wanting to understand your partner, that's really what it's all about. How do I understand my partner? How do I make them feel seen and understood? Love languages amongst all of these other relationship stuff, that's just one tool that I can pull out when I need to pull it out. If you just use it um, and that's it, there's nothing else that you really have towards like how you can make sure that your partner feels loved. Yeah, it's, it's probably not gonna work out <laughs> if that's how you perceive it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's an important thing to note about this book is like, if your relationship is a car, this book is a tune up, it is not going to replace that's your it. transmission. Like, <laughs> it is, You know, so if you're dealing with any of the major kind of red flags in a re relationship in terms of abuse, or mm -hmm. infidelity, or, uh, you know, any of these major things, even some trauma that you have to work through together, this may not be the best tool for that particular couple. This is more for things are great, but there's just a disconnect in terms of the feelings. Uh, but when you're dealing with some really heavy stuff, a gift or a word, it may help, but it's not going to solve it. And, um, you know, and, and I think the book really doesn't go into too much about using the languages to problem solve. It's more just about giving and receiving love. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good analogy about maintenance, because that's truly what it is. It's mm -hmm. a tiny part of the relationship. And it's really just about like, relating to each other. And you know, once again, just making sure that the partner feels like, wow, you really care about me and you care about me because you want to understand me. That's beautiful. <clears throat> totally. Yeah. Um, and um, when I was sort of looking at the book again, um, it occurred to me that um, I think since he, since he wrote it, there's been more emphasis on self-care and self-love. And it occurred to me that some of these languages people don't necessarily know their own language in terms of, you know, mm -hmm. um, telling themselves they're okay, giving themselves quality time, mm -hmm. um, buying themselves something nice. So an act of service to yourself. Um, all of the languages in a, in a way, I don't know, I'm not sure about physical touch. But <laughs> you can touch, I mean, get a massage. There you go. <laughs> right, so yeah. All these things, um, People forget about themselves in mm -hmm. the service of others so much that all of these things actually you could apply to yourself too. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really cool thing about the love languages too is that you don't have to just take it on face value. You can 
like take what applies for you take leave what doesn't you know like I think that's important for any type of like personality matrix it's not more so about like this is now the bible it's what did I like about it what did I not like about it how can I apply this in my own life um and taking that through with you Definitely. And then with any personality uh, type book, you know, we've talked about a couple on this podcast. We always mentioned that like, there's no blood test to know what your love language is. You know, it's not yeah. the scientific, like it's not that it's more of a lens. It's just, mm-hmm. it's just a different way of looking at yourself and a different way of looking at your partner. So, you know, it might change over time. It can fluctuate. This is not something that's, you know, like you said, it's not the Bible. It's not concrete set in stone. It just gives you some language and some lens to look at what the dynamic is that might be playing out. So if you're not sure why you're feeling a certain way, or you're not sure why they're feeling a certain way, maybe this just gives you one potential to analyze as you're in that sort of, you know, place of, um, you know, trying to fix something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And other, in terms of other lenses, I mean, relationships, you can look through many lenses and other people like, um, introversion, extroversion, um, yeah. Instagram, you know, astrology, mm. whatever. Yeah. So this is just sort of another way of, of understanding uh, your partner. And I believe, um, although Chapman's a pastor, he, he purposely set out to write it in a way that it wouldn't be um, Christian only, that it would mm-hmm. sort of apply to, to anyone everywhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think he sort of succeeded in that. Yeah, I, I definitely do. I would say one criticism I do have is that I wish that it was more like inclusive of like intercultural dynamics, because I know that, I mean, for me growing up, physical touch wasn't a thing that was prioritized in my family. So like, I wouldn't necessarily seek out those like it doesn't mean that there's nothing wrong in the relationship of my parents or my family members it just means that's not how we give and perceive love and I think that's something that the book doesn't totally go into because he is writing to what he knows and um it's not an audience that you know is so as diverse I would say but you're right that it's a really good um I think he does do a good job in making it so general that for the most part the masses can identify with it and they definitely have, like, this is in the zeitgeist for sure. <laughs> definitely. I mean, and another criticism I've heard of the book, of course, is because he's a, you know, pretty conservative Christian pastor, you're not going to hear anything about any type of alternative relationships in this book. So if you're looking, yeah. you know, in there for any type of LGBTQ or any mm-hmm. type of, you know, alternate relationship other than like a dating or marriage relationship between two like cisgender monogamous, people, yeah, <laughs> the monog- totally not. Mono- yeah, you're not going to find that in this book. Um, yeah. So it, it's narrow in that way in terms of like, the the examples that he cites and, you know, those types of things. Um, But it's broad in that you can take the, uh, you can take the uh, ideas and apply them in a lot of different ways. And he's kind of done that too, outside of the relationship. So um, he has other volumes of this book where it's like the five love languages for kids. So the parents can think about how to show love to their children. Um, And then there's like five or five languages of appreciation at work. Mm -hmm. So it's like how you have those positive relationships with your colleagues in a way that's appropriate but is still that same lens of like are they understanding how much I appreciate them am I feeling appreciated how do we keep company morale up that kind of thing um so yeah so the lens does apply in a lot of different situations but yeah if you're looking in this particular book for uh something beyond sort of the very heterosexual like dating or marriage like this is not the book for you kind of a thing yeah just take what you like and leave what you don't (laughs) yeah exactly Mm mm-hmm Yes, uh, and also, um, if you are sort of more scientific-minded person, yeah. um, I don't think this book is based on any lab experiments. Where, right. where... <laughs> I think he just studied couples. Yeah, he wasn't yeah. like taking yeah. down these careful right. measurements. Right. No, <laughs> other people have done that, right? Like John Gottman, mm-hmm. he did all mm-hmm. those observing Great. couples and what happens and micro expressions and all of that. Mm-hmm. So um, you sort of, he, I mean, he's come back and said, well, um, no one wants to read like a textbook, you know, about marriage, which is fair enough. But mm-hmm. I mean, these days, I think since he wrote it, the, the bar is a bit higher in terms of 
valid um, you know, arguments that you make, even in this area. So um, if he wrote it today, I think it, there might be more of that. And it's mm. sort of something valid, I think, for, for some people. For sure. Yeah. yeah, if you're looking for the neurology, you're not going to find it in this book. Not yet. But I, I do think that this book was a really great introduction and just validating emotional expression is a very important and valid thing to expect and want in your relationships. Mm. Because a lot of, um, I think that's what kind of caused him to start writing the book was he was observing all of these different couples in his counseling sessions. And he was like, wow, like they keep running into these very like simple problems almost like this person just wants this and they just have to give them this. And it could just be as simple as, you know, understanding this um, love language. So I think back then, very revolutionary. And in some aspects, it definitely still is, but we have a long way to go in terms of how we really maintain and nurture these like incredible romantic relationships in our lives or not just romantic all of them you know family yeah. friends all of that totally yeah so I really like this quote from the book where he says something in our nature cries out to be loved by another isolation mm -hmm. is devastating to the human psyche that is why solitary confinement is considered the cruelest of punishments and so he's just rem reminding us to sort of set the stakes that this isn't just some fluffy like feel-good piece like love and feeling like you're in an important relationship it's it's in our nature it's it's important it is critical um you know so it's just that reminder that it, it might sound like uh, love language is take it or leave it but at its core feeling loved and showing love is is deeply important to to humans as a species and so just something to kind of keep in mind as we as we explore this topic mm -hmm. yes um so uh, Julie, this is the point where we give the book a mark or grade out of five and mm -hmm. say why. Um, Corinne, would you like to start? Sure. Yeah. So um, I give this one a five. I, I really love this book. I've used this book for years. Um, I, I think it's interesting. He's written it in such a way that it's an easy breezy read, but it still feels like um, there's something valuable there. And it's one that I really go back to um, over the years. I continue to think about like, well, why are we not getting along? Or, you know, why are we not understanding? And I, this is something that I kind of use on a regular basis. So I, I couldn't give it anything but five um, just because it's simple, it's applicable, relatable, uh, uplifting. This is one that I recommend to everyone. There's, it, you know, I don't feel like I have to do much um, filtering. It's like, any person could could find value in this so for mm -hmm. that reason I give it a five uh, what do you think Julie I would say I give it a four mm -hmm. just because a five book to me is like you know um but yeah like I think a four just because it is such I love that it's just it's in the current moment like mm -hmm. everyone does know about it in some form even if you haven't like taken the quiz mm -hmm. it's good to know it's good to think about in your relationships it's super easy to implement it's a very like nice thing to have in your toolkit it's something that therapists are working with their clients on so based on like sheer application definitely a four what do you think Tom? um i'll give it three and a half um yeah i think the first relationship book i read was men are from mars women are from Mars. <laughs> uh, <yep. laughs> i've read that book yeah. yeah i think that was one of the early really big ones right and this whole genre it was Mm -hmm. And that was massive. And I got, I got something out of that. Um, and then this one came a lot later. And I really enjoyed it at the time. But while I was reading, I thought, wow, I wish I'd read this <laughs> before. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, <laughs> that relationship might have been saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure. So, yeah, I agree. It, it is one to come back to and remind yourself um, about these languages because it's, it's very easy to forget in, in the thick of a relationship mm -hmm. um, these little things that, that really add up. Totally. As we, as we discussed, feelings can get real messy. And so that's probably the best appeal of this book is it's very clean. It's very simple, prescriptive. It tells you exactly what to do, which is, which is probably refreshing when you're in the thick of relational mess. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, the five love languages was originally released in 1992. Um, the sales grew exponentially every year and it ended up landing on the New York Times bestseller list in 2009, where it has remained ever since. Um, today, it has sold over 12 million copies and has been translated into over 50 um, actual languages. Uh, he, he released a new version of this book in 2015 and has written several other versions of love languages specifically for groups, like we mentioned, so for like children, for singles, and even in the workplace. Um, Chapman and the book have been widely received by marriage counselors, and the book is often referenced by magazines, on TV, and churches all over the world. Um, during the pandemic, there were a lot of blogs and articles written about the usefulness of the love languages while in close proximity to some people for weeks on end, and also while really far away from some people that you love and trying to show them love from a social distance kind of a place. So um, yeah, so that's kind of the update on the uh, the title and the author. Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate you being here. And yeah, um, it was so lovely. How do people connect with you and your work? So I'm not a big social media person, <laughs> um, but you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Julie Wincal, so J-U-L-I-E-N-G-U-Y-E-N-C-A-O. And also on my website at juliewin.love. Send me anything on there. <laughs> Perfect. Well, we'll be sure to include links to both of those places in our show notes. And thank you so much again. Really appreciate your insights on, on this book. Thank you. Yes. Right. And don't forget also to uh, listen to the um, book insight on the actual book summary that we've done, um, which just goes into a lot more detail on all the points in the book. Um, and also there is a 10 point memo uh, on the key points. Um, from the five languages. So uh, make sure you have a read of that as well. That's right. So check out the memo, check out the book insight. And as always, you can find us on YouTube. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And every Wednesday, we'll be chatting with you about a brand new uh, nonfiction book that will change your work in life. Thanks for joining us. Hope you'll join us again next time. Goodbye. Bye.